Matthew's Gospel, the 20th chapter, the 17th verse. While Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will be raised. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favour of him. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, that is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It would not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. Our words today from Matthew's Gospel speaks of the beginning of that final fateful journey to Jerusalem. And with Jesus' words to the disciples of what was to happen in Jerusalem once they had arrived, one can readily imagine the atmosphere, the tenseness, the bewilderment amongst the disciples. Mark, in his recounting, says that Jesus walked off alone and that the disciples were amazed and afraid. But it didn't last. Amazement and apprehension for the future soon gave way and ambition among the disciples rears its head. Perhaps, after all, some of them expected a tangible reward for following Jesus. An echo, perhaps, of the time when Simon Peter said to Jesus, Look, we have given up so much for you. What do we get out of it? A very human reaction and frailty. Matthew tells us that it is the mother of James and John who comes to Jesus seeking advantage for her sons. In contrast, Mark in his Gospel says that it is James and John themselves who come to Jesus with the request for preferment. Why perhaps the difference? Well, Matthew's Gospel is traditionally accepted as being written much later than Mark's, and by the time of its writing, all the disciples were held in great reverence by the early church. And it may well be that Matthew did not wish to show James and John holding such worldly ambitions. So he puts their request into the mouth of their mother. However, in defence of Mark, we should remember that his words are traditionally ascribed to Simon Peter, whom we presume was present at the time. But whether it was the two disciples, or whether it was indeed their mother, such a request, in all probability, stemmed from their kinship with Jesus. If we compare all the Gospel references to the women at the foot of the cross, all speak of Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and a third whom John calls Jesus' mother's sister, the mother of James and John. So James and John then were four cousins of Jesus, and as close kin, and also because of their presence with him since the very beginning of his ministry, they considered, perhaps, that they were entitled to a special place 
in the kingdom of heaven. We do not know. We can only speculate. And it is so easy to condemn the disciples for this show of ambition, particularly at such an inappropriate time. But their underlying faith and loyalty, which lay behind this ambition, is not and never should be forgotten. Leaving aside this recounting of a very human and worldly request, our passage today reveals yet again the nature of Christ. He tells the disciples again and again of what awaits him in Jerusalem. And what is the reaction? For most, one of fear and bewilderment. For James and John, an opportunity for preferment. Jesus does not react in anger, but in gentleness. No impatient words, simply another attempt to lead them to the truth. Jesus said that those who would share in his triumph must drink his cup. What is this cup and what does it hold? For James and John, the future held quite a different road for them to travel. They readily assented to Jesus, that they were ready to drink his cup, but without really understanding the full implications of those words. Because for James, it was to be the first apostle to be martyred. And for John, it was to live to a great age and to die a natural death. For him, the cup was the constant discipline and struggle of a Christian life throughout many years. So the cup of Jesus can perhaps be one of two things. A short, bitter and agonising struggle ending in martyrdom. Or the long routine of a Christian life with all its daily sacrifice, struggle, heartbreak disappointments and joys. There is a story of a Roman coin being found with the picture of an ox on it. The ox is facing two things, an altar and a plough. The inscription reads, ready for either. A supreme moment of sacrifice on the altar or the long labour of the plough. For Christians, there is no one cup to drink, for to drink the cup simply means to follow Christ wherever he may lead and to endeavour with all our might to be like him in every situation in life. Jesus gave everything to bring us back to God. We can do no less than to walk in his steps to the uttermost of our abilities and to love as he loves us. Amen.